Yes.
We pray that as we gather together that we be, have open minds to receive um, the spiritual food that you're going to feed us with this afternoon. We pray that you would bless Sister Adriana, that your Holy Spirit would dwell in her and to um, bless her mouth to speak the word that you would have her to say, that all those listening in will be blessed and can take that information and understand it and um, be able to um, share with others that same truth. Uh, I also pray, God, that your presence be with us, God, that you rebuke the demonic spirit that seek to press in, that your heavenly angels would encircle us and um, block them out, God. I pray that you would clear our minds from any distractions, Lord, that you would help us to be focused on what you're um, saying to us through Sister Adriana, and that we will be able to um, truly comprehend it and to be blessed and also use that to bless others. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, <laughs> the notes in your binders aren't going to help now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I changed things around. You could probably still follow along in, in general, um, but we're going to. So we're doing the fourth day, Doki War and Up War 2 and 3? We are, but I sent the emails out. I think Sister Victoria um, forwarded you the new notes. Okay. But the one thing that from yesterday we were saying, and I hope you guys did, is I hope you printed out your um, your paper with the three the three ones. Uh, com yeah, this with the three empty lines, so that you can fill them in as as uh, along as we go. So get this one ready. Um, we're going to start here with the Third Guy Doki War. Then we're going to do World War One, And then we're going to do our application on our line um, simultaneously alongside both as we go along. So, so how much of these notes are like totally changed? We'll be able to watch some of it or what? Yeah, some of it. But I, that's why I have it up here. Okay. So you can follow along there also. Um, OK. So we're going to start. Um, so we have had lines that we built um, that Sister Tess put on. Let me, let's just go look at that really quick. OK. And this is what we have here is the Alpha and Omega history of Pyrus. This is Pyrus in Macedonia here. And then this is Pyrrhus in Italy. Italy or against Italy, whatever, against Rome. Um, then we have World War II. And then we have our line. So we used these three lines. We compiled the way marks and what happened in each way mark. And we were able to build an idea of what's happening in our time here. What we've had, if you can see here, in this area, there's a big gap, okay? We go from, um, on this line, 9-11 is on here. So based off of these lines, it goes from 1989 to 2014. And there's a huge area missing because these battles and these wars don't show us anything in that region. So is there anything that can you increase size a little bit for Sister Susan? Yeah, it's just going to get cut off a lot, so. We, we can't read anything. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first two. And it's um, in the new notes that I sent you guys, this picture's in there, but it's probably small. Um, so this is those way marks. And if you can see, we looked at those battles and how they matched up. And they all matched up so that you're looking at specific dates in our time and these are those specific way marks that those battles all match up to. And so you have a huge gap here. Um, we're still gonna have uh, 2016, 2014 Rocky Canyon and Sunday Law, but what the lines of the Third Diadoki War and the lines of World War I are gonna do is they're gonna fill in this gap here, okay? So you're gonna see new way marks being popped up in this area. 
uh, showing us what's going on there. So it's not this exact same line being repeated. It's, um, it's an, an addition of information, right? Uh, just go back to your graph real quick. I mean, your the pirate versus, and then go down uh, to the first world war. This is this. World War II. Oh, sorry, World War II, sorry. Um, is that supposed to, okay, yeah, got it. So it's April 1st, 1939, and September 1st, 1939. Okay, yeah. Um, and you're gonna see that also with World War I, just because things happened really quick and it was a four year war and it went fast, but um, there's, there's two 2003s on there, you'll see. Um, anyways, so we're gonna fill in that, that gap there because when you look into history, you see a lot of events happening in that area and you see things that can be classified as proxy war situations, knowing what we know now about the Middle East, but we never put it on the line before and we never explained where exactly it fits in. So the Daidoku War number three in World War One do that. Her thing that she said is that um, Daidoki War, did something wrong? No, we were saying that we're going to do a screen capture on, I didn't your, have on your time to write all that down. <laughs> but that's not, you don't need to. That's, um, that's on the website. I can put that picture up on there so you guys can download it anytime. That's not the focus. Oh, okay. It's yeah. just, she was just pointing out that between 1989 to 2014, there's nothing there. But yeah. World War One is going to It's not the one that goes on this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. You're fine. It's just a review from way back when. Okay. Um, so what was I saying? So she was saying that Daidoki War Three and Daidoki War Four are like two histories of failure, just like World War One and World War Two. My question is, I don't think I was able to find this anywhere. Um, for Daidoki War Three, I think the only thing we ever did with it was add it into Pyrus's line of Macedonia because you have the Battle of Ipsus here. And the Battle of Ipsus is the end of Daidoki War IV. So I think this is all that we did with putting the Daidoki War IV on the line, okay? And we're gonna go back here. So we have the fourth Daidoki War, we're familiar with that, it's in the line of Pyrrhus. Um, you have Antigonus and Demetrius plus Pyrrhus. Um, they go up against three allies ending in the Battle of Ipsus and that's what we just looked at. So we're gonna track the superpower of Antigonus and Demetrius. They become the superpower during Daidoki Wars one and two. So it takes during those wars for them to, to come up into uh, prominence. They're still pretty strong, but they're not the strongest yet. So that's their rise to power. After Daidoki War two ends, Antigonus emerges as the superpower. From here on out, they were battling against the three generals that we are familiar with. Constander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy. Um, but before this, there was other generals as well. So we see that there was a temporary armistice after Daidoki War III, and then it picked up back up in Daidoki War IV. This shows us the same pattern of World War I and World War II. So we, we already used the Alpha History of Pyrrhus to show us in Macedonia how, how World War II worked. Um, so we have three different histories overlapping, showing us how it all works in our history. So this is what we're gonna do again. Um, so you have here these Daidoki War three and then four with Pyrrhus and Macedonia, World War One and World War II. And what we're gonna do is even break this down further down the middle and stack them on top of each other. So you have them, um, where is my, let's see if this works. So we're gonna have Daidoki War three here, and then World War One, and then we're gonna have it tell us what's happening with our line over here. Okay. So um, because we know that we have this and this, and we have the triple application of Bible prophecy, um, which is one plus two equals three, then we know that Daidoki War three plus um, Pyrrhus and Macedonia, and also World War I and World War II added together equal the Third World War for our history. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so get your little piece of paper out with your um, way marks, and we're going to start filling that in. We're going to start with the Third Daidoki War, and um, we 
let's see here. So we have uh, in Diver of World War II, you show how this King of the North is a superpower that dominates in World War III, or Daidoku War III and IV came to be. In the Second Daidoku War, we have a very big rival ten taking this name of many. It's in the back. If you, if you write small enough, you can use the one with three lines, which I did. This is how I write, and it'll fit on there. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, success. Yeah, no, I'm so happy. In the second day, Doki War, you have Yumenis. This is the biggest rival that Antigonus has um, right now. So, uh, Yumenis is a very powerful general. He united together a lot of the generals in the east and massed a great force. He also had the elite fighting force of Alexander the Great, called the Silver Shields. These guys were really old and experienced. Um, they're very elite. But they were very old by this point when this war happened, so keep that in mind. Um, Eumenes gathered his generals and marched east against Antigonus. So this is the second Daidoku war that's happening, okay? Um, at this time, Antigonus was allied with two people, Python and Seleucus. And here you have, um, you have Seleucus. And we all, we know he's also a king of the north, but he's not going to play the part of the king of the north in this battle Antigonus is, because he's the focus. So Seleucus and Python are just his generals, they're aiding him, they go to battle on the side of Antigonus. So when Eumenes reaches a river where the two armies um, meet, this is, there's two battles, because I looked into this, uh, and there was two battles, this is one where they had, they met an, and had an altercation and they both had losses. And then Eumenes thought he won, and so he left back towards the east, but Antigonus followed him, and then they met at Gabin, and that's where it went down. So um, at this river um, here, they battle, and Antigonus loses some troops and resources. Eumenes, thinking he won, turns back, but Antigonus pursues him. They reach the field of Gabin, and there they fight again. So this is the battle that we're going to put down here. Um, Antigonus sends his troops with his elephants, over the battlefield and their stampeding hooves blow up the dust and cause a huge cloud to form through which it is difficult to see. Antigonus uses this opportunity and he sends troops around the dust cloud and behind Eumenes and they take the baggage cart of the army of Eumenes. This contains the whole wealth and belongings of the soldiers in his army, especially the silver shields because they've had everything built up these many years in battle, all their wealth and their stuff and even their families everything was there as they're moving from place to place fighting because that's their job is just to warfare all the time so their lives went with them and it was all contained in this baggage cart thing and the uh, uh, antagonist's troops went in there and they took all that away so after all the fighting is done that night he many decides that um he's sick of keeping fighting antagonist he's going to finish him the next day before he has a chance to push through that that same night the silver shields come in, and it turns out that Antigonus told them, you're going to give me Eumenes, or you're not getting your lives back. This, they're like six years old by this point. They're old, they're tired, everything they worked so hard for was just taken away. So they didn't care about Eumenes at that point, and they just handed him over to Antigonus. And Antigonus wins because of um, these two things. So it doesn't matter how the battle on the field turned out, because Antigonus won anyway. And the two main things we want to take away from this is that Antigonus defeats Eumenes from the inside. He doesn't directly defeat him through fighting. It's, um, he was only able to do this because of the elephants. The elephants decided this battle. That's the second thing. But so the elephants allowed his troops to go get the baggage cart. And because of that, his own people, Eumenes' own people, um, rebelled against him and gave him up to the enemy. So it was from the inside that he was able to be defeated. And so we're going to want to take that up and put that on our line. Where is it? Okay. So we're going to write here, and we're going to say Battle of Gabine. And 
they were going to say he had two allies. She spells it different. I'm going with how A.T. Jones had it. We'll just call this the third. Instead of there be war. Uh, so what happens here, Antigonus defeats Jimenez from the inside. And at this point, what else is going to happen is Antigonus has no more rivals. He is the strongest power. So after Daidoki War II, he emerges as the strongest power of all the generals that were left after Alexander. And so he takes the title Master of Asia or Master of the East. Okay. I'm going to put that there. And I'm going to go by the people here who I can see if they're ready or not. So you guys online, quick, quickly. <laughs> okay. I've got it. Got it stuck. Um, good. We're just going to do this. Um, also, what we want to make sure we know before we go any further is that, okay, so for my notes, what I ended up doing is I added some tidbits of connecting thoughts that um, I was struggling with to understand. And I took certain things that were like fillers in there that she was addressing people out, and I took some of the quotes out. All of those quotes and everything, all the transcribed notes are in the first set of notes you got from me. These ones are tailored to how we're going to go through this. They're just very focused on the Diagnosis of War Three and World War One. So there's not much extras in there. Um, so it's just very focused. And so here, um, really quick, what I want to note is that Eumenes in this situation is representing the king of the south. And Antigonus is representing the king of the north. And this is not based on geography because you don't see that in, on the geography in this war because you have Eumenes in the east and Antigonus in the west. So the only way we were able to arrive to the conclusion and the application of Diadochi War Three is to already have Pyrrhus's wars and World War II established. Um, otherwise, it's hard to start off at the line and figure out who it is and what's happening. So, But here you see the King of the South dies. And when the King of the South comes back into our story, it's not going to be through Eumenes anymore. It's going to be through Ptolemy. So keep that in mind. So this is the end of Eumenes. We don't see him anymore. And Jigmas ends up killing him after some time. So, But that was... Um, the king of the south falling. So they, uh, they, they. The way we progressed is we had physical geographical locations, the Giza that allowed us. Okay. So now we have Antigonus as our emerged superpower. And if I can find, this is the how the Diadochi Wars are going on. And you guys don't have this, but it's somewhere you do in your first email. So you have Diadochi War I from 321 to 320, Diadochi War II from 319 to 315. This is, there's little bits of time in between, but after here, this is where Antigonus emerges as the superpower. And um, for future reference, Diadochi War III is gonna be from 314 to 311, and War IV is from 308 to 301. But in between, in between Dadoki War 3 and 4, you have the Babylonian War, and this is going to be very important later on. It happens between War 3 and between War 4. So, hold on. Okay. And we can refer back to that if necessary. So he begins acting, he takes the title Master of Asia or Master of the East, and he begins acting like a dictator because he's the sole superpower now. He has no one to challenge him. So he begins killing the weaker generals and taking their territories. At this time, Seleucus had Babylon. This isn't the Seleucid uh, Empire or dynasty yet. He just had that territory because Antigonus helped him get it. So he had Babylon. Um, Antigonus goes too far at one point and he kills Python, who was his former ally. This scares Seleucus. Then you have Antigonus march, marching over towards Babylon. So Lucas decides to flee and he leaves everything. He thinks he's going to be next. So he goes down to Ptolemy in Egypt. Um, in your first notes, there's 
some video uh, URLs that I linked in there of some cool history stuff you guys can look at in your videos on YouTube. So he abandons Babylon and goes down to Ptolemy. He tells Ptolemy and the other two generals who we know Cassander and Lysanopoulos to look at Antigonus and to look at how he's acting and what he's doing um, and how dangerous um, he is right now because of how powerful he's become. He's acting unilaterally, right? So they all decide then that he has to be stopped. So this is between the second and third Diadochi war that this is happening. You have the three allies come together, Cassander, Lysanopoulos, and Ptolemy. Um, we always said four, but that's not quite right because Seleucus at this point has nothing. He abandoned everything he had. He has no territory. So Seleucus is just a general of Ptolemy. And so you have three allies, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, plus Seleucus is fighting for Ptolemy. And this, remember, Seleucus and Ptolemy, they're friends. They're helping each other. They're fighting together. This is the important in our application. So Seleucus at this point... Um, oh, before we go any further, let's go back to our line and let's put our next one. We're going to put Python is killed. And you have Antigonus acting like a dictator. Okay. So you have the three allies come together, and um, so Lucas has nothing to do. So they put together an ultimatum for Antigonus. They say that he needs to share some of his wealth and territories with them and stop acting unilaterally or like out of control like a dictator, or there's going to be war. They ask him to share his power, but Antigonus instead immediately marches to war. Now is the beginning of the Third Diadochi War. This war is again over spheres of influence in that same special area that we're familiar with, um, the area of coal Syria. Okay? At this time, Ptolemy had coal Syria and all that area of influence. So it belongs to the King of the South right now. Um, really quick, in Diadochi War II, we saw that Eumenes was representing King of the South. Now we have he was defeated, so that title goes to Ptolemy. So now in Diadochi War III, you have Ptolemy being the king of the south. Ptolemy has control over that area in Coal Syria. He also has Seleucus there with him under his protection and acting as his general fighting for him. So Antigonus is marching down, and we can look at the um, map really quick. So where am I even? Okay. So this is this area. Where's Tyre? Okay. We're going to say this area. Right here. Okay. So that's always our area of coal Syria that's in question. So Antigonus and Demetrius march down here and they take all of that. They take everything in that area and then away from Ptolemy. So the king of the north just took away all the spheres of influence away from the king of the south. And I think we're going to go back to our lines and we're going to put in ultimatum. No. Ultimatum. So we have our three allies. I just abbreviated. Um, to Antigonus. I'm going to move this over, and we're also going to add. Antigonus attacks Ptolemy. Attacks. 
follow me and he does this for spheres of influence. Someone's gonna have to keep an eye on the time because I'm not paying attention to it. What time do we stop? I don't know. <laughs> Hold on, let me find out. Um, is it? Maybe. I don't know what time it's going to be. 15 minutes, right? Yeah, 4 p.m. Okay. So we're gonna go back. So Antigonus, after he takes the spears of influence away from the king of the south, Ptolemy, he goes back up north. He had some other generals in some other areas take some uh, territories away, and he went to check on those and conquer other things. So um, he goes back, and he leaves his son to take care of that area of Colseria, the area that they just um, took all that area away from Ptolemy. So Ptolemy seeing an opportunity, marches his troops out of Egypt and goes up to fight Demetrius. Demetrius is still young and he has advisors there with him who tell him not to engage Ptolemy in battle. Demetrius doesn't listen to them and he goes to fight him and Seleucus because Seleucus is there too. So they meet and fight in the area of Gaza. This is also the area known as Raphia. So this area has two, two names. Okay. And there's Gaza, right here. Okay, so it's very close to Egypt. So um, Demetrius loses. He's completely crushed and humiliated. He loses all the territories that he and his father had just conquered. So we have here at the Battle of Gaza, aka Raphia. The king of the south winning back all the spheres of influence he had just lost. So Gaza Raphia, king of the south winning. That's exactly what we've known to happen in that area. So let's go back to our lines. Uh, and we'll put the Battle of Gaza. And we'll say. Ptolemy defeats Demetrius. Okay. okay. Ptolemy defeats Demetrius. <clears throat> Then we have Antigonus hears about this, he finds out, and he um, marches back down with Demetrius and takes back all the territories, all the way, all the way up to the borders of Egypt. So we call this the net, basically. If you guys remember Raphia and Panion when we first figured that out back in the day, it said he will overflow and pass through. And I think it was Isaiah chapter seven, verse eight, or chapter eight, verse seven. I don't remember which one it was. But it explains that overflowing and passing through means to go right up to the neck. So you don't go and take the head, you just go right up to the neck. So he goes all the way up to the neck or the border of Egypt, but doesn't take Egypt because he is distracted. So Antigonus has two distractions. He had the Nab Nabataeans, I'm pretty sure I spelled that wrong, uh, and, but they are the descendants of Ishmael. They're, um, they're attacking his various armies in their various territories. Uh, they're just annoying and irritating. These Nabataeans um, are said to be the ones who became the various Arab nations that we now know in that area. So that's one distraction. The other distraction is um, he had to deal with Seleucus. So after Ptolemy and Seleucus defeated Demetrius at the Battle of Gaza of, of Raphia, Seleucus saw his chance and went back to Babylon. 
So he probably figured that Antigonus was going to care about the fact that his son was defeated and he was going to march back down and take that territory away, which then means he wasn't going to be watching the area of Babylon and it was going to be left uh, vulnerable. So Seleucus goes back there and he takes Babylon back. Uh, so Antigonus needs to go deal with Seleucus and take, you know, deal with that situation. So he decides to enter into a peace treaty with the three allies. So this back and forth, you had Antigonus go down, take the area of Colossyria from Ptolemy. Ptolemy went and beat Demetrius and took the areas of Colossyria back. Then Antigonus and Demetrius went back and took the area of Colossyria back away from Ptolemy. That, those three little encounters, those three little back and forths were the third diadochi war. So now you have Antigonus make a peace treaty with all the three allies called the Treaty, um, the Peace of the Dynasts, and it was like a temporary ceasefire. And at this time, they decided to have a peace until Alexander's son would become of age and become like a leader of some kind. This is when they were still pretending that they were actually gonna, you know, actually let him be king one day and they're just babysitting, but that wasn't gonna happen. Cassander ends up killing Alexander's son and his mother, Roxanne, later anyways. but. Either way, the treaty is signed, and now Antigonus, um, Diadochi War III ends, and Antigonus is free to go deal with Seleucus. So, um, but we see that it's not the real end. This treaty is just like a temporary ceasefire. So now Antigonus can go address two problems, mostly that being Seleucus. Seleucus had become pretty powerful at this point, and when Antigonus went to take Babylon back from him, he lost. So Seleucus actually won the Babylonian War, which we saw earlier. Um, no, what's going on? So right here, this Babylonian War, Seleucus wins it, and he takes Babylon away um, forever until he dies, and or until his progeny back, you know, when the king of the north finally dissipates on Daniel 11, whenever that is. Um, but that's called the, ba the Seleucid Dynasty. That's where it starts is when he wins the Babylonian War, and he takes Babylon from Antigonus permanently. Can I see that little chart one more time? I just gotta get one, one date down. This? On what one for? Yeah. This one. Is that in the notes? It's in the first slew of notes I sent out. Okay. Okay, but if I get it now, then I know what I'm doing. Go ahead. I got it. Yeah. If, yeah. Okay. Um. So there, there you have it. So let's go back and fill in our line with the last couple events. Um, we have the peace treaty, the peace of the dynasts, and right before here you had Antigonus go to the border of Egypt. Um, okay. So we're going to put that the two distractions we had were the, who went to the border? Antigonus Antig and Demetrius went to the border of Egypt, but they didn't go in because he was distracted by the Nabataeans and Seleucus. Seleucus in Babylon. So then we have the Babylonian War. And here we have. Why do you put the line there, the, the dashed line, where it says to the border? Why uh, do you have it dashed? This is how just oh. did it. You don't have to. But oh, it okay. went to, because she had it drawn on there on the map, a dashed line where the border of Egypt was a piece of it. So it went right up to the, to the next border. I don't know. You don't have to, though. Seleucid. So I just wanted to know what that meant. Like if it was symbology, yeah. Yeah, yeah if it a border, was. basically, if it was, pretend it's a border. Um, oh, and then these guys are Ishmael. The of Ishmael, yeah. Okay. So we're going to go into the application of World War One, and the way she did this, the way we're going to do this is we're going to skip the middle line. 
the middle line is going to be for World War One, and we're going to go to the bottom line, and we're going to make the application for Daidoki War Three there. Then we're going to go back to World War One and add the applications from World War One on that bottom line some more to make an even bigger, fuller picture, basically. So we're going to if everyone. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just do. Okay, so now let's go to the application. Uh, Lane, this is where I'm going. Some <laughs> we're gonna have some videos that we're gonna look at for a quick second and a little bit. But this was really cool to see because we have the papacy come in to this application in a way that we didn't see before, which was really interesting. So um, based on our lines, we know that at the beginning of our line, the king of the south died and then comes back. Um, when we apply this to Daidoki War III, we can then see that the U.S. is the king in the north and Eumenes is the Soviet Union because in our time, there was two different king of the souths also because it, when it rises back up, it's not the same as it was before, so it fits perfectly. So we have Eumenes as the Soviet Union. And then when the King of the South switches again to Ptolemy, we now have it turn into Russia and Putin. So you have, um, and it's not just, it's not just the King that goes down, it's the kingdom too. And then that whole thing resurrects with like a different King and a different kind of kingdom. So it, it's like a new thing. Um, and so then we also know that in Daidoki War III, the King in the North has two allies from what we just saw. He has two allies that help him win the battle against the King of the South, the first one, the Soviet Union one. So in our line in that time period, who did the United States have to help in the battle against the Soviet Union? The US had the papacy with Pope John Paul II, Reagan and his deal with him, and um, they also had the Mujahideen in the Middle East. So um, we have two, just like in our Daidoki War III, where Antigonus and Seleucus, we saw that we have made application of them both being the king of the north. We know that the U.S. is the king of the north, but we also know that the papacy was also king of the north. So we have the papacy now. Um, it's going to be Seleucus. And so what's left is the Mujahideen, Mujahideen is going to be Python or represented by Python, okay, in our application. So we also know that Eumenes was defeated from the inside. Antigonus with the help of his allies, took the baggage cart of Eumenes, his, his economic will, and his people revolted against their own leader and overthrew him because of that. This, is, um, this was accomplished by the work of elephants as well because we saw that it wouldn't have been possible to take the economics without the information warfare. So um, we know that in 1989, with the, help, with the help of the papacy, the United States um, through information warfare, like Radio Free Europe, the different radio stations, they were trying to push in all of Europe that everyone in the communist countries were sneaking and listening to, and through helping the Solidarity Movement, um, and also through economic sanctions, they were able to bring, that, bring down the Soviet Union, and they put information warfare in the ears of the people in Russia in the Soviet Union, and they put economic sanctions on them to the point where they were so finished with it that they overthrew their own government. So they defeated the Soviet Union from the inside, just like Eumenes was defeated from the inside. And so what you have um, is, we're gonna go to our lines. And like I said, we're gonna go down to our bottom line. Skip the middle one, let's go down to the bottom one. And we're gonna go here. So oh. why are we skipping the middle one? Are we going to come back and fill it in? Mm -hmm. oh. The middle one is going to be World War One. Oh. And we're going to keep building on this bottom one. So okay. I'm going to draw here. We also want to add um, another one. So we draw a little line and add another little thing here. So what are we calling this uh, line? Mm, this is going to be, just leave that there for now, because that's going to be from World War One, I, I think. Um, but so you have 1989 to 91, and you have the Vatican, and you have the Mujahideen, 
and um, USA defeats USSR. Yeah. Did, little, you, little, did you add a little way mark? You yeah. added a way mark to the left. Yes. Okay. okay. The little one. Cool. And I think I'm just going to put it down because we're going to talk about it in a minute. Let's just put um, Iraq pro Russian. And we'll just leave that there for now. We'll talk about that later. And then this is 10 years. <sighs> Okay. Are you about to watch movies now? Or are yeah, in a little bit. It's just like a few minutes. Um, one of them is a little bit longer because of I, I never realized how close Putin and, and Pope Francis are and I thought it was really interesting to see. I didn't, I didn't realize. But um, it, it becomes important in our life. So now we have the U.S. emerging as the sole superpower. Gorbachev saw this and made his attempt for a multilateral uh, planet Earth, but that didn't happen. The U.S. took the, stat the status of sole superpower and began to act like, like it in any ways, whether people liked it or not. So you have the Mujahideen that were trained by the United States military turned into the Taliban, okay? So you had Python, right, the old ally of Antigonus. So the Mujahideen that were the allies that helped bring down the Soviet Union, they turn into the Taliban and they overthrew uh, the Afghan government in 1996. So now the Taliban is in control of the Afghanistan government. The Taliban has um, this terrorist organization that becomes radicalized called Al-Qaeda. Um, and this is also with uh, bin Laden and Saudi Arabians and people from all around that region go over there and they become radicalized. And um, I'll let Hillary Clinton explain more in a minute. And after 9-11 in 2001, the United States invades Afghanistan to destroy them and to remove the Taliban from the government. This was them destroying their former ally that helped them fight in the war against the Soviet Union. Okay, Elaine, do you wanna play the first video? First one? Yeah. Yeah, stop sharing the right hand. Okay, yes, yes, yes. We will do this. Uh, yeah, you have to share screen after this, huh? I think you are share screen. Yeah, but I need to open it up and then share screen. Sometimes it works for me. I know. It depends. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. So I'm go straight to the link. I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan. And then we said, great, goodbye. Leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall. And we thought, OK, fine, we're, we're OK now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back. The people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviets. Ah, uh, so it's not a conspiracy theory, it's history. And it's history that's being repeated in Libya and now in Syria. But there is a bigger problem here, one that every American should be questioning. We're fighting Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, but we're also bombing Al-Qaeda targets in Pakistan and in Yemen. And as we do that, something occurs known as collateral damage. Hundreds of civilians in Yemen have been killed in just the first half of 2012 by U.S. airstrikes aimed at Al-Qaeda fighters. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them 
control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what? Sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI, the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen. And that's great. Let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and <coughs> other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And with, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is, wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow, because we will harvest. Okay, and so we now are making up for a lot of lost time. So that's someone who knew what was happening in the history of the U.S. who didn't make it <laughs> that office, but I thought it was interesting that, you know, she was Antigonus. She was the old guard, and she knew, they knew how to protect this country and this constitution, and they had the history right. So however what we may think of her and then the the... The ancestors, they, they did know a few things. So. And it's interesting that you, on the other side of that, we have Donald Trump marking 1989 as the, we're the superpower. What else did he mark? We're the superpower in the internet. He's, he's said that, you know what I mean? Back yeah. then. He that did. it coincides with the information war age rising up, the yeah. US does too, so we must be intertwined together. So back in 1989, he knew what was going on his side of things. Yeah. Yeah, because he got onto Twitter pretty early, like really as early as it came out. I think he was he was on there. So and uh, Sister Tess made a point that that's an important thing, whether people want to realize it when or he not. got on Twitter. Yeah, it was an important thing. It's his weapon. Yeah. So we're gonna mark this. Um, two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand one. So we're gonna say. 2001, you must have made that. I'm sorry. I'm going to draw a line because underneath here we're going to add some um, applications from World War I in, a, in not too long. See, I'm not alone. No. <laughs> I'm this little moment. So, okay, let's go back. Um, oh, millennials. How oh, similar. Anyways, um, so after, wait a minute. What? So what qualifies you as a millennial? When do you have to be born? Um, I think it, it's 19, ooh, I think it's, I don't know. I can't remember, but I think it's, it's either 1999 or 2000. It's one of those. 2000 is Generation X. I oh, thought. yeah. So that's Generation X. Isn't it like 90, 1990? Somebody Google. Uh, yep. I'm going to Google it. Because that's interesting that everyone thinks the millennials are the problem, but millennials started out on our line at the time of the end. If that's right, that would be interesting. Anyways, just uh, to not feel so bad about being a millennial is all I want. <laughs> Anyways, after... <laughs> After 1989 and the alliance between the U.S. and the papacy, everything soured. So that's, they were allied there. 81 to 96. That's what I see. 81 to 96. Okay. For millennia. Hmm. I'm in there. All right. That's fine. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, so the Pope sees the U.S. as acting unilaterally, just like Seleucus saw Antigonus acting like a dictator, all crazy like. Um, and does he doesn't like it. So the Pope doesn't like it. We always had this idea that they are always an alliance or secretly somehow and we're just not seeing, right? Because that's what I had thought too, that, oh, they were in alliance then. They're probably still like in a secret little alliance. No one knows, you know, conspiracy theories. But that's not how it was. Um, in many public statements, Pope John Paul II and now Pope Francis and all the Pope, like they've been speaking out against the United States and against the Gulf War and what the United States was doing there. So um, 
Also due to this, the papacy has developed a close relationship with Russia. So Pope Francis and Putin are good friends. Um, they meet a lot. Putin is considered a regular at the Vatican. We're gonna see a video of that in a second. Um, but so you had Seleucus abandoned Babylon and he went to Ptolemy. He went to the King of the South and Seleucus and Ptolemy developed a relationship. So they were friends. This is interesting considering later on um, you had Seleucus take the territory of Pulseria and Ptolemy was fine with it. He left it alone. So I think it's probably because they had this long friendship going back in the day. And then it was their ancestors that ended up fighting over that area. But anyways, so you had Seleucus and Ptolemy. So you have the, the Pope and the King of the South being friends in Daidoki War Three. And do we see that in our time with Pope Francis? We absolutely whoa, do. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I'm not too good on the wars. Yes. It's kind of bad. Okay. So the Pope is in two, has, is it, are we, when we're talking about the Pope, we're talking about our time or say that again? You said the Pope two, two, two different times. Yeah, because we had, um, she didn't talk about Pope Benedict because he was between Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis, right? Because there's been three in our time since 1989. Um, but since 1989, the U.S. and the papacy haven't been on the line. Since then, whoever's been in charge of the papacy has been against the United States. So we have clear things from Pope John Paul II, statements that are against, who, which is in the transcription notes, the actual videos, you can watch those, she talks about that in there. But then you have Pope Francis also speaking out multiple times against the United States, acting like a crazy dictator. And while it's speaking against the United States, it's cozying up with Russia, which is the king of the South. So it's like Seleucus and Ptolemy together. So the Pope is an, is an alliance, uh, is a alliance of Russia. I, I don't know if it's, I can say alliance alliance, but they're there together and they're fighting on the same side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, that's why I was confused. I thought the uh, papacy was on the side of the U.S. So. Well, this is, let's, if you want to click the next video and start it, seconds, 26 seconds, and we're just going to go to two minutes and 21 second minute mark. So just start at 26 seconds. This next one, and if you and read, it's in Russian. I'm gonna let you know right now, but read the subtitles if I think there should be subtitles. Uh -oh. I don't think we can get around that. Yeah, you. There we go. You can keep keep the sound off because we don't need it. Turn on the subtitles. 20, 26. They're on there, yeah, 26. Are you guys going to share screen it? Yeah, oh, no. and just a second. Yeah, well, I'm just getting it to the right place first. Don't let you put in your... Yeah. Sorry, I had to get it there first. But you're still shared. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can override you, though. Oh, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I have the power, remember? <laughs> <laughs> so just so look, at, look at the body language between Trump, between Putin and, and Pope Francis, and look at how they talk about Putin and the Vatican. How can they come here? Refresh it. Yeah, you do. Okay, maybe. You want me to mute it? Is that what you wanted me to do? Well, we were not going to understand. So mute it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So the straws, so it's taking him through the scenic route. Um, there's a receiving party. Where are they? They're, this so is the Vatican? Putin is received is more uh, often than anyone else. He's visiting the Vatican. So the papers, when he when Putin came here, they were calling Putin a regular at the Vatican. He's been here, this is like the sixth time and his third time meeting Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. So they're very good friends. And it's interesting the things that they talk about. Because remember sp spheres of influence. Because Antigonus and Demetrius, they took... Um, Cola Syria and the spheres of influence of the King of the South. So when you have Pope Francis or Seleucus and Ptolemy talking about spheres of influence that were just taken away 
by the king of the north. You look at what Pope Francis and Putin talk about in a minute. So, so what you could do is because it goes really fast, you can slow down the speed so it's easier to read. I've, I've been explaining to you what's going on because I watched it a couple times. So there's some other things going on in there that's not that. Yeah, he looks pretty relaxed. Like, yeah, he doesn't take the same, like, you know, no, Tomcat. He's not dragging his arm for his gun either. Yeah, he's, he's not trying to shoot Pope Francis. He's all <laughs> friends with him. Yeah, look at the biggest smile on his face. He looks like a little boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Francis, that's right. Okay. Um, so they had private talks a lot that whole day. With just, see, Syria, Libya, Venezuela, Ukraine. Um, so this is what they discuss. These are the these are spheres of influence that the King of the North is fighting over the with the King of the South. So you have Ptolemy and Seleucus right here talking about what Antigonus just did with Demetrius. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have these two friends. This is exactly like a fulfillment of this line. So that's all I wanted. That's all we need. You guys have this video in there. You can watch the whole thing. So I close this one? Yeah. That's in our notes? Yeah. Okay. And the new ones too. So I'm going to need to review this because it seems like everything's flying over my head. <laughs> what did, what, you what? Have, I had to, no, it's going fast. Go on. Yeah. You, got, you got food fog. Yeah. You were saying that Putin, Putin and Francis were friends? What was, like, what was that based off of? What do you mean? Because the connection you're making to the previous history. Yeah, so in in um, um, in Diadochi War Three, you have Seleucus, which is representing the papacy. Go to Ptolemy, who's representing the King of the South, and they're together and they're fighting together. Okay. Okay, and then that video just shows you. Plus, all the um, the quotes in the transcription notes you have. Russia saying that the U.S. is acting unilaterally and no one feels safe. And you have the papacy saying the United States is acting unilaterally. They're crazy and no one is safe. So okay, they that, are on the same side. That's what I'm looking for is the reason why they were allies. Because everyone who goes to visit the Vatican, the video shows the same thing, right? Like they, they look like they're friends. But what you're saying there, that makes a lot of sense. If they're both saying the same thing about the unilateral thing about the United States that's what I'm looking yeah for. And, and she pointed out that this is the sixth time there I mean who yeah. goes there that many times he's, who's invited them he's times? a regular and he's entertained the Pope also so right there yeah and um, that was Rome right yeah Where that's they at the Vatican. yeah the Vatican and Rome yeah. yeah and he did and he did they they both disliked Trump yeah. that. And, I mean yeah. yeah and they both looked really relaxed yeah. not like they were coming up against the enemy but yeah, I think but I'm, I'm like totally confused. Then. So where are you putting that on this line? As so Lucas and Tom. We're gonna put it on in a minute. Okay. We're gonna we're I'm just showing the relationship between the king of the papacy and the king of the south. Okay. But they. Okay. So we're gonna go backwards now, and we're gonna go to 2003. Um, so you have the United States wants to go invade Iraq. The UN comes together in opposition. There was no reason for the U.S. to go to Iraq except, um, except by some contrived ideas. Um, and everyone in the world knew that the U.S. was making up this story to go in Iraq. No one wanted them to go there. The Pope, I think it was still Pope John Paul II there, kept yeah. speaking up against it. He was like, you have, the U.S. has no business there. And then Russia, Iraq is a, is a Russian sphere of influence so they definitely didn't want to have that in there so Russia gets France and Germany in on it and so now you have three allies in the UN go up against the US and give them an ultimatum saying if you try to push this bill in the UN to try to go make war with Iraq we're going to stop you we're not going to let you and we're going to veto that bill that was the ultimatum and we know the US went there anyways so you have um, three allies plus the king of the south and the papacy, so Python and Seleucus, well not Python, what was it? The king of the south and Seleucus, Ptolemy and Seleucus, all up against the Antigonus, right? Um, so we're going to go to our lines. And um, that's from a different perspective, right? From Diodoki like, War III? Yeah, from in speaking of Antigonus, because Anti um, Antigonus is also, um, maybe I have it wrong, wasn't it Clinton in one perspective? Antigonus was Clinton. In, uh, That's in, in a whole different, different yeah, yeah, whole different, yeah. Yeah, and this yeah. one, Antigonus is the king of the north, um, the crazy person. 
Um, this is the same one that Anipsis, who fought him, Demetrius, and Pyrus fought against the three branches of government. Mm -hmm, yeah. But there, this, it, it, Demetrius is, see, the perspectives are... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was like, that's a whole different... But to understand, just put, put all of that out to not confuse me. It can get really complicated. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to put UN Ultimatum 2003. Mm -hmm. 2003, and you had Germany, France, and Russia. Okay. And they give the United States an ultimatum. So, Um, like we also said, the U.S. goes to war anyways with Iraq, so we're going to put that. Doesn't matter the ultimatum. This is later on in 2003. Um, and since Iraq is a U.S., is a Russia sphere of influence, we're saying that U.S. attacks. Russia's sphere hmm. of influence. And then I'm going to point this is a this is just a little tiny thing she wrote down on the line next to that. In 2007, it didn't fit on here, but in 2007 is where you have quotes from Putin saying, no one feels safe. Look what the U.S. is doing. No one, no one feels safe. They're acting like a crazy dictator to the whole planet. So. Is it fear of what? Huh? Fear, sphere of influence. Sorry. Yeah. Sphere. Okay. That's interesting. In 2003, who was the president? Bush. Bush. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Bush. Hmm. Just going to stick that in there even though she didn't have it. Because that was confusing me. That was 2000. Okay, you got it. Okay. 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 We have four minutes to get through the next two remarks real quick. So we're just going to do a little bit of skedaddling. Oh, three. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so they said if the U.S. tries to put, okay, so Iraq in this situation fell under the sphere of influence of Russia. Russia propped up the economy um, and helped them. So Russia, they had huge deal of ownership over Iraq, but the U.S. goes in and takes Iraq. Russia at the beginning stages tries to help Saddam Hussein in much as much as um, they could with trying to, you know, intercept CIA, you know, plans and where they're trying to meet and whatever to try to stop them, but it doesn't last long and they can't hold that area. Um, so this was Antigonus and Demetrius taking back Colosseria, taking Syria, Colosseria away from Ptolemy, okay? This is, this is not bad. This is just the first time Demetrius and Antigonus march down towards um, Colosseria and take that area. So this is like the battles of the Dido II or III proper. So we know that at Raphia or the Battle of Gaza, you have Ptolemy go against Demetrius and with Seleucus as a general and help take back that sphere of influence. So I was wondering if, if this means that we need to see the papacy involved maybe helping Russia to take back the spheres of influence in the Battle of Raphia. I don't know, because they were working together in Diadochi War Three, at the Battle of Gaza or Raphia, um, the papacy and the King of the South are working together from that perspective to take down the U.S. with information. So I don't know, or spheres of influence. So I don't know. Maybe we should be looking at what Pope Francis is doing. But she didn't say that. I was just wondering. Um, so now is the moment that Seleucus uh, takes. Seleucus take to go make truck. I'm pretty sure I meant to say tries there. Tries to go make his move. It is after the Battle of Rathia. So while Seleucus goes off to take back his territory, you have Antigonus and Demetrius unite once again and come back down um, all the ter to take back all the territory, which will be Panion. So the U.S. is going to take back. 
Yeah, in the beginning of that sentence, you have no instead of so, the one you just read. No is the moment. You want so. Where your arrow is? Up or down. Now is the moment. Oh, now? Okay. So um, after Raphia, you have the U.S. going back to take all the spheres of influence, and this would be the Battle of Panium. So after this, we know that Antigonus accepts a peace treaty. This is my other question was, um, for the, that way mark, um, in all the other lines, you have Antigonus or whoever is there taking a peace treaty to destroy the King of the South. So I'm wondering if there's um, an alliance with, with the King of the North and someone else to be able to take down the King of the South at Panium. So I don't know, just another question I had. Anyways, he had to sign a peace treaty to be able to go deal with Seleucus. So we now have two lines that show peace, that's, yeah, okay, anyways, I want to, blah, blah, blah. so at Sunday Law, however, we see that the Seleucid dynasty begins. Um, no, it's fine, it's it, it is a smaller dynasty within the bigger dynasty of Antigonus, but that's not true, because I looked at the map, um, do I have it? Map of, what? Mar, no, oh, no, oh, uh, Gaza. So this, this isn't small, this, this dynasty here of Seleucus, this isn't small. So if we're, if by the application of the Third Diadochi War, you have the papacy coming in at the Sunday Law, taking its own territory, this is a huge territory, right? You know, pretty Your almost- cursor isn't moving, really, or it's not shown on the screen. Why doesn't it do that? Well, but it's not going anywhere, so see <laughs> But you said it wasn't showing, but I, I, mean, I mean, you know what I meant, like her Oh, yeah. Hold on, I got this. Your mouse wasn't moving up on the screen. That's not my mouse. Oh, that's probably why. So mm -hmm. this is Antigonus. That's a big empire, but look at this. This is the Seleucus. And some of it's cut off, but it's also a huge empire. So if we're saying Seleucus is the papacy and Antigonus is the king of the north, this this is going to be a big thing that happens at the big Sunday law on our line. So anyways, um, so this is the end of the application of Diadochi War 3. Let's fill in our lines, the last few ones. And we did it in time. What? I know. I need a lot of review of this one. Yeah. I know. And it will come. You just have to keep looking at it millions of times. Oh, your presentation. Sunday, Diadochi 3, Monday. Oh, it just goes yeah. repeating. Yeah, so this is why I thought it would be beneficial to just yeah. keep repeating it because you can't get it out first, right? Yeah. There's just no way. Battle of Rapia. Okay. Oh, and right, well, no, that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be later. Um, Russia defeats USA. Um, and then um, we know, and this is what we're going to add, that when the U.S. defeats Russia, it's going to take all its spheres of influence back, just like it did with Egypt and Ptolemy right up to the border of it. So we're going to have Panium. And we're going to have Russia loses. But it's interesting that the Diadochi War Three says that in this history here, you don't, don't write what I'm about to write down, but in this history here, what's happening is the Babylonian War. And what the Babylonian War is, is um, it's a fight between two kings of the North. So I don't know what it means. I don't know if that's something we're going to continue to apply or add an application. I don't know. But I thought it's interesting that this time period you have the Babylonian War, which is the fight between two kings of the Norths, and they both get a piece of the business here. So I'm just going to erase that. And all you need to put there is Sunday Law. And that's it. OK, let's go ahead and pray. And remember, we have a question and answer period. So if we're going really fast, if you have questions, write them down and then ask them during that time period. Are you going to go for World War uh, the next, The next 
has another episode. Oh, okay. I was like, is that it? But <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for helping that be done in a timely way. And we um, ask that you please help us to get to know all this information and help it to sink in a little bit by little bit, Lord. Um, help us to see all the new incredible things that this application shows us in our history and all the truths that it opens. Help us to understand them and be able to start applying them to see them throughout history as we've seen all these other things come to fruition. We thank you for continuing to add more information for us so that we are not in darkness as to what's going to happen in our future, so that when these events go through, that our strength and faith is built. Lord, we thank you so much, and we pray that you continue to help us for the rest of the day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, 